Hi, I'm V. Neal and I'm in the chair. I first got interested in makeup when I was very young, probably like five years old. I loved watching all the old black and white horror films on TV and I just thought it was such a cool thing that you could turn a human being into something else like a Frankenstein or a mummy or any of the crazy characters that were seen in those old black and white movies. Gosh, some of the makeup artists that influenced me would be, I mean, Jack Pierce, of course, because I watched all those old black and white movies all the time. Fred Phillips, my mentor, who did the original Star Trek TV shows and Outer Limits. Stuart Freeborn, who did like 2001. John Chambers, Dan Streetpick, for like the guys who did Planet of the Apes. William Tuttle, who did Seven Faces of Dr. Lau, one of my favorite old movies. Tom Berman, who I actually have worked with a lot. And of course, Stan Winston, who I absolutely adore and got to do several movies with, which was really fun. Rick Baker was a huge influence. I mean, he just created one fantastic makeup after the other. And Greg Canham. I mean, both of them were amazing. Of course, we can't forget Dick Smith, who all of us were, you know, influenced by, you know, the god of makeup. Well, the first steps that I took starting my career in makeup were kind of like going in the back door, actually. I always wanted to do makeup, but I was always told I couldn't do it because I was a woman. Funny enough, I had a vintage clothing store and I used to save vintage clothings for all these different big rock bands and then eventually I started making costumes for some of them and there was this one little local band that I started making clothes for. They were kind of space inspired. They let me dye their hair and do their makeup and all this crazy stuff and eventually they said to me, well this is all well and good, but we want we want big brains and pointed ears like on Outer Limits. And I went, cool. I said, well, I don't know how to do that, but I'm gonna go find out. And so I did, I went to a science fiction convention and I met these guys that were dressed up in Planet of the Apes makeups. I said to them, where did you get those masks? And they said to me, oh, very indignantly, they said, oh, these aren't masks, these are makeups. And I said, even better, where did you get the makeup? And they said to me, we made it. And I said, that is so cool. Will you teach me how to do that? And they all kind of like bewilderedly look at each other and said, but you're a girl. And I said, yeah, I know, isn't it fabulous? And that was kind of how I started. Um, they acquiesced and they said, sure, we'll teach you. One of them uh, was Steve Neal, whose last name I took because eventually we became an item. And it was just easier to say we were married because, you know, we were living together and it wasn't all that popular back then. So Steve actually taught me how to, to apply and actually taught me lab work, which I really hated, <laughs> and I eventually stopped doing that, and then he would do all the lab work, and I would do all the applications as we started getting these little jobs one after another. So thank you, Steve Neal, for teaching me how to do makeup, Rick Baker for letting me hang out in your garage, and everybody else who I ever hung out with back in those days. I never went to a makeup school because actually there really weren't any makeup schools back then. I pretty much learned by doing. I kind of always thought that makeup was kind of like cooking. If you knew what it looked like and they had all the ingredients, you should be able to figure out how to put it together. You know, just like ingredients and cooking. If you know what it tastes like, you should be able to figure out how to cook it. And that's kind of was my, you know, theory on doing makeup. So. If I ever had a question, like I said, I used to hang out with Rick Baker in his garage and he would give Steve and I jobs and we would give him jobs. And, and also, one of my, actually my mentors, Fred Phillips, who I met when I was going to the science fiction conventions, when Steve and I first started out, we would get these jobs that were actually union jobs, but we couldn't do the applications, but we could make everything. So we would make everything and then we'd call up Fred and say, hey Fred, can you go apply this for us? So Fred would go apply everything that we would make and that was kind of a nice little situation having, you know, connection with union, union people at that point. Anyway, I absolutely did not go to a makeup school. Um, I kind of learned by doing and if people would call me up on the phone and say, we're doing such and such, can you do that? And I go, oh sure, and then I'd panic and hang up the phone. <laughs> I would look at the one crummy book I had, like Richard Corson's stage book, which was, you know, so overdone and not appropriate for film at the time. I would look in there and see if I could find anything, or I'd look on a movie and see what somebody else had done, and I thought, well, I could do that better than that. And, or I'd call up Rick and say, hey, Rick, have you ever done this before? And he'd say yes or no, or he said, I'll call up Dick and find out, and I'm going, or you call him up. And I go, no, no, I can't call him up. I was, I was ter always terrified to call up Dick Smith and ask him questions, because I thought he'd yell at me or something, I don't know but he was such a kind man, it never happened, obviously. So we would just, you know, talk to each other and uh, ask each other questions and try to figure it out, you know, amongst ourselves, as it were. When Steve and I first started doing makeups, we worked for a gentleman named Charlie Band, <laughs> who did a lot of B-movies. He was like Roger Corman. He was just the other Roger Corman. 
um, who came in a little bit later. But Charlie made, you know, he made halfway decent, you know, B-movies. There were some really great ones like Laser Blast and Tourist Trap and The Daytime Ended. Funky little things that weren't really horrible, but they weren't fantastic. Those are kind of the first films that I did and after about three years working with Charlie in the mid 70s the the union had to open up their doors to more makeup artists because they evidently didn't have enough uh, makeup artists according to the government so they let in a lot of makeup artists that had a certain amount of days within a time frame that was like between June and December of such and such a year I just happened to have the right amount of days on this one film that I worked on called Shoot the Sundown with uh, Christopher Walken and Margot Kidder. It was like a Western. I got all my days on that and I was working on another really fantastic non-union picture called The Dark. And I actually remember the day when I got the phone call from the union, or actually it was probably a, um, you know, I got it on my beeper or whatever. And they said, if you want to have your name in the book, you have to come and bring your money right now. Well, back then it was $1,500. It might as well have been 15000 which it probably is now. <laughs> I went to the first AD. We were shooting on a yacht down in the marina. And I said to the first AD, I said, I just got a call from the union to bring my money down so I can get in the book. Can I go give it to him? And he goes, absolutely. He said, go. So... I took off and took my money down there and I said, I've already um, told this company that I'm going to do these other movies with them. I said, is that okay? Be, you know, they could have cared less. They didn't even want us in there. We were called 30 Day Wonders. That's what they called us because we didn't have to take the makeup test, which was like a big deal. I mean, everybody would always freak out when they had to take the makeup test. For those of us that got in during that period, we didn't have to do any of that. So we were called 30 Day Wonders. There's always been networking. Like I said, I would always call up Rick or we'd call up Dick or you'd call up other makeup artists that you know. You'd always call up and say, hey, I'm looking for work. It was important back then and there was only a few of us, but it's even more important now because there's so much competition. But not everybody is good at everything. So if you keep up a network with your friends that you all sort of do the same thing so that you know that if somebody has a job that they can't complete, that you would be good at, then you know they're going to give you that job. Or if you know another makeup artist that's really good at like body painting, or beauty makeup, or fantastic, you know, uh, like avant-garde stuff, it's really important to have your network of you know like friends around you so that you can all help get each other jobs. And that's and that's why it's so important to have a good outlook and be professional, be kind to each other, and don't backstab because you know what? Even though there's a lot of us, it's a very small community and all that kind of bad talk and all those things really get around quickly. So you wanna make sure that you always stay kind and professional to each other and help each other because it's only gonna be more beneficial for you in the long run. There's a lot of set etiquette things that you have to abide by these days. And it, it's not only like your, your outlook and your temperament with people, but you have to know how to speak to the director. You have to know how to talk to your director of photography which is really important because he can make or break your makeup so if you set up a good rapport with all of these people that will help you look better it's only going to be better for you in the long run you don't want to talk too much you don't want to certainly don't want to be talking around the monitors where the director is a lot of people start schmoozing people they shouldn't be schmoozing and I don't think that that's the best thing to do I mean it's certainly good to introduce yourself and find out who they are and like your producers and all that and make sure that they're aware of who you are but I don't think it's necessarily important to be you know carrying on and going out to drinks with them and you know doing whatever else people like to schmooze with but as I said it's really important to have a good rapport with your DP because he will make you look good and by all means, you want to be really good friends with your Teamsters because they're the ones that take care of you and your trailer. And you always want to have a good foot forward with the Teamsters because they're one of the best people that's going to help you in the long run to get your equipment in your trailer, get you set up, make sure you have a good vehicle to work in. So it's really important to have a good rapport with everybody that you work with on the set. Probably it's the same advice I give to everybody now, you know, just stay positive. My advice that nobody ever gave me, and I sort of realized that right off the bat, was, you know, a lot of makeup artists want to become friends with their actors. 
they feel that that's going to kind of endear them and ingratiate them to the actors and keep getting jobs that way. And you know what? It usually winds up blowing up in your face because actors are fickle. They'll go off from a movie and they'll go do a photo shoot somewhere and they'll meet somebody else and then before you know it, you don't have a job and then your heart's broken that you don't can't work with them again. That's kind of the one thing I always say. It's like, yeah, you want to be friends with them when you're on the job. Don't try to think that that's going to keep going, you know, because shit happens you know there the next job somebody has a friend that wants to do makeup on the movie and you're not going to have that job then so stay professional always stay professional be the artist that you want to be don't talk about people don't do anything that's going to come back on you later you know that's going to haunt you in your career so that you you know have a black mark somewhere and that advice kind of works across the board in every aspect of the job i would think you know, when I started out, women makeup artists were kind of like a, an anomaly. They, you know, we just sort of hadn't really existed. There were a couple of female makeup artists that they were always stashed way in the back of a studio room someplace that nobody ever knew about. And I didn't even actually find out about them until about, I don't know, about eight years ago when somebody told me that there was two makeup women. One of them did Marlena Dietrich. I mean, can't be much more famous than that but they were never talked about. I don't know why, and I don't know why they were always, we were always told we couldn't be makeup artists, but it was just kind of a freak thing that there was a couple in there that nobody knew about. I was day checking on the TV show Dynasty, and there was these older makeup gentlemen that ran the show. And I remember the day I got there, they said, here, take these sponges and pencils and go in the back over there and cut them all up and, and shave all the pencils. And I thought, okay. So I went back, I cut all the sponges because I was really good at cutting sponges. Did them perfectly, and this is before we had pre-cut sponges, so you had to start with a big block. We used to use ebony pencils for eyebrows, and you used to have to shave them with a razor blade, and not a lot of people knew how to do it, but I had been taught by Fred, so I knew how to do all that. So I went in the back, and I shaved the whole box of pencils and did the thing, and I came back about an hour and a half later, I said, okay, it's all done, and the guy looked at me, and he goes, really? And I said, yeah, and I said, do you want to see it? So I went and got everything and went, wow. So. I think I just blew them away by doing the simplest stuff that maybe nobody else really knew how to do unless you had been trained. And I guess they thought, not only is she a 30 day wonder that's been trained, she's a woman as well. So I'm hoping that I kind of broke down a little bit of a door there with something as simple as cutting sponges and shaving pencils, you know? But it was weird. I mean, they, they didn't know what to do with this. They didn't know if we really knew how to do anything, let alone where we knew, but we were women, so they weren't really sure. Which to me is so bizarre because I always wondered why men were makeup artists. How do they know about putting on makeup? They don't even wear it, you know? So I thought it's like a natural thing for a woman to be a makeup artist, especially a beauty makeup artist, but you know, go figure. Wow, there's a lot of makeup women now, and I venture to say there's probably more women than men doing it now. I mean, the men now are mostly into the effects zone, and for a while there, there was no women doing effects either, and now there's a lot of women that do effects makeups. Funny enough, I was one of them that started it, and it was like, not only was I a makeup artist, but I also did stuff they didn't know how to do when I got in. So I was even more of a freak to them that I you know, knew how to do all this crazy stuff that they didn't do. So that was kind of a step up. When I got my first real job when I got in the union, and it was given to me by my mentor, Fred Phillips. And I was in my little house in Valley Village, I had done a TV show called The A-Team, and from that show, I was able to purchase my first home. So anyway, I'm in my little house, and the phone rings, and it's Fred Phillips, and he goes, Hey, V, how you doing? I said, Hey, Fred. And I said, So cool, I'm in the union now. And he goes, Yeah, he says, That's why I'm calling you. He said, You work with Bill Shatner, right? And I said, Yeah, I did I did a couple of films with Bill, just because I did Kingdom of the Spiders and something else, I don't know, some other B movie with him. And he says, Well, you know, they're, they're going to do... Uh, they're gonna be making a Star Trek movie. Do you think you'd kind of want to come and work on that? And I went, are you kidding me? Of course I want to come work on that. You know, I mean, we were Trekkies. Everybody was a Trekkie back then. Anybody that had anything to do with effects makeup was a Trekkie. I like was so blown away. So that was like actually my first big union job was working on Star Trek, the motion picture. And it was, pretty awesome because it was directed by Robert Wise who is a huge famous director back then and I got to do all kinds of cool stuff on it. I did the I did the big brained alien on the bridge. I took care of uh, Leonard Nimoy when he was on the set. I got to do the three principal Klingons. It was awesome. We had like all the big old makeup men on that show too because you know they had done Planet of the Apes by then and a lot of those guys because they had done so many westerns they were really good at laying hair and doing all that beard work. So that was awesome to watch them do that stuff. 
A great creative collaboration is when you have people that can all really work together well, that share ideas well, that can see each other's visions. Tim Burton is one of those kind of guys because he's actually an artist. So he'll give you like, you know, drawings so that you can kind of get your juices flowing to see where you want to go. You know, I've worked with really great costume designers. Colleen Atwood, who does all of Tim's movies, she's amazing. Catching Fire with Trish Somerville. She and I worked really closely together because when we were creating all of Effie's characters, and there, she had eight different looks in that movie, I think, and so it was really important for us to see what the costume was going to be, and then we'd have to figure out the hair, and then I'd have to figure out the makeup. So the three of us worked very closely together to create these characters. But this is kind of what a great collaboration is, just people that share a vision that can really work well together and create a really special character. The A-Team TV show was something I did right at the beginning of my career, right after I got into the union. Originally, um, Steve and I made a Loch Ness monster creature, and the people that were doing the A-Team pilot wanted to borrow this creature for the Hannibal character to do something with, or I don't remember what. As a result of that, we started uh, talking to them about doing other things, and then before you knew it, I talked to the department head there, and I came on as a second to do makeup with him. We had so much fun doing that show. I mean, I loved it when I got to go on second unit. I must have made 300 ball caps. I, I don't even know. Because I was always did Mr. T's double, and he wore a ball cap, and then I had to put the, you know, the mohawk on him and everything. So I loved working with the stuntmen, and I loved the fact that nobody ever, there was like hundreds of rounds of bullets being shot up, but nobody ever got killed. Cars would be flipping, and they'd jump up and get out of the car and run away. Eventually, I became department head on the show, so I worked with George very closely. What a special guy he was. Now, that was a movie star. George was a movie star, a bona fide movie star. I mean, come on, Breakfast at Tiffany's, hello? I'm just a lovely man to work with, and I got to do all those disguises on him. It was great to go to work every day, and we never worked at dark almost because George always went home at five o'clock. It was just a blast. We had so much fun doing that show. The Lost Boys was so much fun, and The Lost Boys came into my life because I knew Joel Schumacher. I had done Incredible Shrinking Woman with Joel Schumacher, and he asked me to come on to do The Lost Boys. And we had lots of discussions about it. And initially they were talking about Steve Johnson doing the makeup. And I said, oh, please don't have Steve Johnson do it. It's gonna wind up looking like Fright Night. And we didn't, I, I really didn't want the vampires to look, you know, scary like he had them. And I said to Joel, I said, Joel, these vampires have got to be sexy. They've got to be really good looking. We want every guy and girl to want to sleep with these guys when they come out of that movie theater. I said, they have to be fabulous and they have to be beautiful. And I just went on and on and on. And Joel goes, okay, yeah, you're right, okay. And I said, please give Greg Canham a chance. Please let Greg sculpt these for me so I can have a pretty vampire. So that's kind of how that all started out. And there you have it. The rest is history. We had beautiful, sexy vampires. I first met Tim Burton um, when I, well, let's see. I had just finished doing Lost Boys, and Bo Welch was our production designer. And he came to me, actually, we were probably still on Lost Boys. I think it was towards the end. He came to me, he said, V, he says, I just read this script, and this movie is like perfect for you. You gotta go over and get the job. And I went, well, okay, but I gotta know, you know, who to talk to and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, well, I don't know everybody yet, but I'll find out and I'll let you know. So he gets back to me and he says, so-and-so is this, so-and-so is that. Richard Hashimoto is our, our, he was the UPM. I said, I know Richard, he was the first AD on 9 to 5. So I called up Richard and I said, Richard, can you get me in to talk to the director? I want to do the movie. And he goes, it's way too early, V. And I said, okay. <laughs> I said, well, when it isn't too early, will you let, get me a, you know, like get me in there and let me talk to him. So I was the squeaky wheel. I just kept calling up Richard and telling him I wanted to come in and meet him. He goes, okay, V, it's time to come. I walked in the trailer and I see these sketches hanging up on this old cork board on the right hand side they said okay uh come on in here this is tim and i walked in and here's this young scrawny kid with hair sticking out all over the place and a rumpled t-shirt all just like a big mess and i went wow that's our director okay cool <laughs> and i just started talking to him and he was such a trip he was so much fun to talk to and i thought i hit it off really well from the first time i had another uh, interview with him and we started talking about the characters and everything. That's when I, you know, he says, you know, I want the people in the afterlife to be like colored, like cartoon characters, kind of 
pastilli. And I said, you mean like NECA wafers? And he, was, he said, yeah, like NECA wafers. Well, NECA wafers, probably nobody knows what those are anymore, but it's a old sugar candy. It's like little discs that came in this wax paper that were all different colors like pink and green and yellow and you know anyway I don't know why I made that analogy to him but I did but he said pastel and that was the first thing that came into my mind we just started talking about everything and before you know it I had the job I guess I don't remember all the details but I did get the job so that was cool well I think all those cool iconic characters that were produced with my collaboration with Tim are directly out of his mind because all of his characters are these pasty little things with dark circles around their eyes I mean Maybe not as um, tidy as the characters that you know I produce for him on screen, but certainly that's out, that's his vision, you know, and that's kind of what I think a makeup artist is. We're the director's tool, you know. A lot of times we do create our own characters and bring them to life because maybe the director or whoever doesn't have the vision, whether they know what it is or not. We are their tool to make bring that person, that entity, that creature, whatever it is, to the screen to make everybody pay attention to it. And Tim, you know, always had that vision. So you kind of had to play around with it a little bit, but you finally got there. You know, like for instance, when we did Beetlejuice, I was doing the first couple of tests I did with Beetlejuice were literal translations of these drawings that he had done. And he looked at me and goes, oh no, they're, he says, it's too realistic. It's too scary. I, he, you know, we won't be able to look at him very long. You know, I did a couple of them and it still wasn't right. And I'm thinking, well, okay, now this guy comes from the same pastel world. So this guy's got to be more like these other characters, not like this drawing, supposedly. So I said, hey, Tim, I said, why don't you just let me go back to the trailer and do what I want to do and see how he comes out and see if you like it. And he goes, okay, fine. So I went back to the trailer and I said, Steve Laporte, who was working with me, I said, Steve, we got to make this guy like not scary, kind of funny, but really creepy and pastel. <laughs> And I said, so I think we make him kind of like a real pale, pale yellow color. You know, let's make him look like he crawled out from underneath a rock. And so at this point, we sent a PA off to a hobby store and I asked him to get some crushed foam like they use on these, you know, when they do trains and you know, all that kind of stuff. So they brought back this three different kinds of green crushed foam and we just started gluing it on him. So it looked like he had moss growing out from underneath his collar and underneath his hair and everything. I did the dark circles and the dark circles weren't black. They were brown and purple actually, kind of a combination of brown and purple colors because everybody thinks he's white with black circles around his eyes, which indeed he is not. That's kind of how I came about with that Beetlejuice character. And I thought, okay, maybe Tim will like this because it's more cartoony. And then, you know, he'll follow in with the rest of the characters. And he's funny enough looking that he won't be scary, you know? And then also Michael put in his two cents. He goes, I really want to be unrecognizable. I said, okay. He says, can you give me a broken nose? And I said, hey, Steve, do you have any like broken nose appliances in your stuff at home that you've done on other shows? Any molds for that? He goes, nobody says, I have these swollen lips. I said, okay. And I said, well, you know, we just figured out we'll put one on this side and one on that side and it'll just look like he has a broken nose, which is exactly what we did because Steve had tons of them. That's what we did. And then Steve made him some teeth and I had my nail lady come and put really nasty fingernails on him so we didn't have to glue them on him every day. He actually had acrylic nails that were sculpted on his hands. That's kind of how we came up with Beetlejuice and Tim loved it. So, you know, working with Tim was so fabulous because he did have that kind of thing with the dark circles and everything and all of his characters kind of had that same look to them and which I did many of them I mean Edward Scissorhands who didn't have really dark circles but he definitely had dark shadows around his eyes Johnny and I figured out this thing that if I slightly changed the shape of this of the darkness around his eyes that it would give him different expressions on his face which we did in the movie nobody ever noticed but Johnny and I knew it especially like for the end scene where he goes to kill the young blonde character, I made it so he looked like he was really pissed off. So, you know, I changed the shape so it really went like this, like he was like really mad. You know, we did subtle stuff like that, but that was another, you know, one of Tim's dark circle characters and the penguin and, you know, all of these characters that all had that similar look. Even when we did Ed Wood, when I was doing the Bella Lugosi character, Rick Baker gave me this beautiful makeup to put on Martin Landau. And I don't know if we were testing or if we were shooting. Maybe it was like a test day one day. 
I did the makeup. We took him in and Tim says, oh no V, he looks too healthy. You got to darken around his eyes a little bit or something. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so I took him back to the makeup trailer and I'm putting dark around his eyes and trying to make him look, you know, like sickly and stuff. And Rick walks in and he goes, God damn it V, he says, I knew the minute I gave you this makeup, you were going to put dark circles around his eyes. <laughs> Just my I said, it was not my idea. It was not my idea. And Martin stood up for me. He goes, no, no. Tim told her to darken my eyes because I look too healthy. That's his aesthetic. He likes dark circles, I guess. I don't know. It's just he feels that that gives it more drama, I guess. I'm not really sure. It was just a little funny little Ed Wood story. I loved working with Johnny Depp because he really likes to transform himself. I did Edward Scissorhands with him, pirate films with him, Sweeney Todd. I did a film called Blow with him where he had to go through many years of changes all the way up into his 60s. And that was fun. We put, oh my God, we must have had eight different wigs and hair pieces on him to transform him throughout those years. He loves to use makeup to transform himself. and. I mean, there can't be anything better than that for a makeup artist than an actor that really likes to be in makeup. I did the first makeup test with him, and that was with Stan Winston, who I adore working with. The penguin makeup obviously was already something that was designed well before I came into the picture, and knowing Tim's aesthetic, I sort of, you know, applied it accordingly. <laughs> I think in order to make him more palatable, it was much better to use that Tim Burton thing that I'd been doing with the solid dark circles and the pale skin and, you know, the bad teeth, and of course then I added um, the mouth goo to make him look even more disgusting with the bile all the time. Yeah, Danny's fantastic to work with. In fact, Danny stole me off the end of the that Batman film to go on to a film that he was directing called Hoffa with Jack Nicholson. That was really a, a cool movie to work on because I got to age uh, Danny and Jack, like bring them back earlier in the years like the, to make them younger and then take them also into their late 60s. So for a makeup artist, that's really cool because you got to do really subtle transitional stages with them. And that's actually kind of some of my favorite stuff to do is that really cool subtle character work that's really believable. Because it's uh, something where you can actually take some, somebody and change them into another person without making them grotesque or into some kind of creature or something, but just to change them enough to make them another believable human being is kind of really a cool thing to do. So I love doing character work like that. It's really fun. Mrs. Doubtfire was a result of a collaboration with me with Greg Canham. But Greg and I were friends, so we kept in touch quite a bit. I met Greg through uh, Rick Baker. When it came time to do this film, he asked me to come up and do the film with him, and I don't think he ever intended to stay there to shoot the whole thing, so he wanted me to make sure that I was, like, you know, there to make sure that we did the test properly, blah, blah, blah. So we did the first test, and Robin, the way Greg was painting it, he kind of looked like an old man, and I said, I said, Greg, I said, we can't do a speckle fest on him. It can't be like an old age makeup. He looks like a fat old man. He's got to look like a sweet little old lady. And I finally said to him, I said, okay, you go home, you let me do this, I'll take care of it. He'll be a sweet little old lady by the time we're done. I redid the test like I wanted to do with the pink cheeks and the little bit of the eyeliner and the, you know, the lashes and the whole thing. And he came out really cute, I thought, and everybody was really happy and we got Mrs. Doubtfire. One of my favorite films that I worked on was Galaxy Quest, and that was another Stan Winston project. Even in that one, Stan had created a really cool new technique where the Sarah's character, which was the big green guy, he had a way of operating his mouth with this thing that was inside his mouth that Stan had created so that he could move his lips. And that was really cool. And of course, all the rest of them was operated by external, you know, cables and stuff. In fact, I did his wings at one point and, you know, there was all kinds of fun stuff we were doing. And of course, Alan Rickman was so much fun to work with. He had a blast and I mean, that was like something he had never done before, something crazy like that character. You know, we were shooting that out in Utah in the middle of nowhere and I mean, nowhere, <laughs> you know, except for when we were in the studios, but when we were out in the the field, we, we had so much fun. I mean, because we just had to depend on each other to have fun with. A Star is Born, what a great little film that was to work on. And Bradley Cooper, he was a dream. I got a call to go in for a job interview. At least that's what I thought it was. And I went in and I was talking to, you know, Bradley and to the DP. 
we were just sitting there talking about the characters and different things that he liked to see and I gave him all my thoughts on what I thought would be good and after the interview I thought well that went pretty well so I said well okay I'll um I guess I'll talk to you guys later you know you let me know what you think and he goes what are you talking about and I said well you know I guess if I got the job or whatever and he goes oh no you already had the job when you walked in here and I went what <laughs> and he goes oh yeah Jennifer told me I had to hire you and I went Thank you, Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> okay, cool. That's the first time that had ever happened. But wow, what a great movie to work on. And I had already worked with Stephanie, Lady Gaga. Um, I had done her first video with her paparazzi. And then I had also done a couple of covers of Rolling Stone magazine with her. So I had known her from many years previous to that. And she was so cute when we were doing the test. She goes, oh my God, V, it's so nice to see you. She goes, you did my first video. Now you're going to be here on my first movie. I'm so excited. And I thought, wow, she remembered me, you know, because I mean, you know, who knows? She's met a gazillion people. The whole movie was so much fun to, you know, work on with the music. Bradley was amazing. I mean, you know, he learned how to play the guitar and sing. And oh my God, it was fabulous to watch them doing all the numbers. And Stephanie was such, she's such an incredible little actress. I mean... Who knew? We were all blown away. She was so good in it. It was a bitchin' movie. That's all I can say. <laughs> I've been asked the question if I would redo any of my makeups. I think maybe the only one I would have liked to have tweaked would have been Edward Scissorhands because I really hated the scars that he had on him. And they didn't even touch it up on the poster, which really kind of was very upsetting. We played around with all the scars so many different ways. And actually, unfortunately, I was given like these little wormy foam scars which were really crappy if we would have had transfers back then it would have been perfect you know we could they just blend right in or little elvisite scars which we did but a lot of it was all done by hand i would like to tweak that a little bit but as far as redoing anything i don't know i mean if we redid mrs doubtfire now it would kind of take all the charm out of it i, I don't know i don't know that i'd want to redo anything i I think that there was just such an organic charm to a lot of those old-fashioned makeups. No, I don't want to, I don't think I want to redo anything. Just maybe tweak the scars on Edward, that would be it. I've had a really, I gotta say, impressive career, even, you know, I'm not tooting my own horn. I've been really fortunate to have worked on some really fun, really artistic films where I've gotten to show a lot of different kinds of makeup. So, I don't know, I'd have to pick one for each type of makeup and I don't know if I can do that, but I had a great time doing it. Thank you for watching In The Chair.